Broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. Welcome back to episode 156 of the Freight 360 Podcast. Today is going to be a great episode, all about what makes a prospect a good prospect or a good customer. But if uh, first off, if you are brand new here, welcome to Freight 360. Uh, if you are not brand new here, welcome back. This episode is brought to you by Blue Book Services. Blue Book Services is the resource you need if you're transporting fresh produce. Their online database contains thousands of companies throughout the produce industry supply chain. You can easily search their database to generate new sales leads. Blue Book's credit ratings help you avoid companies with high credit risk, and their team can help resolve disputed loads. To learn more, go to ProduceBlueBook.com and click on Join Today. That's ProduceBlueBook.com. All right, episode 156. If you're watching on YouTube, you see me rocking a Bills t-shirt. We're recording on Thursday, September 8th, and this will drop tomorrow on the 9th. But tonight is the opening game of the entire NFL season, and it's the Buffalo Bills ho- or being hosted by the reigning Super Bowl champs, the LA Rams. They'll be doing a... Uh, banner raising ceremony in Los Angeles later today, which you guys will have uh, already seen if you watch the game. Uh, but I, I gave a prediction last week, and I'm gonna I'm gonna change it. I'm gonna say the Bills win by ten points or more. Well, that's what I put my money on <laughs> on FanDuel. So uh, it was a long shot, but I hope uh, and that Josh Allen puts up like a ton of yards. So we'll see, man. It's gonna be uh, it's good to be back. It's going to be back in the NFL season. It's been a long time waiting since last year and the disappointing end for the Bills uh, at the, you know, playing in Kansas City in the divisional round. But uh, I don't know, man. We don't have any we'll, – we'll have lots of stuff to talk about next week, but not a whole Steelers, lot. I think Steelers are an underdog against the Bengals by like 16 or 16 and a half as of like this morning. Did they name Trubisky as the starting quarterback? I think. That's what they talked about this morning. Um yeah. I, have, I think he's the right move. I think he's definitely the right move. So, um, we oh, will I also see. I, I spoke too soon last episode. I thought the Bills were going to sign the uh, the local guy as a punter, and they didn't. They ended up getting um, Sam Martin. Uh, he was with Denver the last couple of years, and I think Detroit for a handful of years before that. But he, he's a veteran. He's like in his thirties. Um, but uh, Pittsburgh, man, they're, so they're playing the Bengals. Yep. Yeah, they should be an underdog because they have a a brand new quarterback on their team. And Trubisky's yeah. he's, you know, terrible he's line while. or questionable line. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, C- yeah. yeah, Cincinnati had a uh, heck of a year, year last year and obviously a Super Bowl run. Um, I don't know, man. I might take Pittsburgh to cover that. 16. I mean, it, a lot of points. Because you got to think, you know, if uh, you get towards the end of the game, if the Bengals are up by like 10 or 12, you know, exactly. Slow down the play. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, you know, get the clock going and kneel it out. So who knows? We shall see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, anything else in the world of sports? Not really. Pretty slow week. I mean, we did have a we had a, somebody sent us a question asking if we could timestamp the uh, <laughs> when our sports banter is done because he he listens or watches it at work. And I don't know if he's like, you know, a Patriots fan or something, and he doesn't want his coworkers hearing me talk about the Bills or what. But, no, nah, we get it. We get it. We used to do timestamps. Um, it got difficult because we started putting a lot of content in the show, and it, like, you know, tried to, just to try and do a quick edit on it, right, and get it ready to be launched on Friday. Um, yeah, remember, we have – we both have – other jobs, you know, we don't just, we don't just do the podcast. So try to make it as quick as possible, but Hey, we're going to try it out. We're going to give this guy a, what he wants and I'll throw, we'll throw timestamps in the show notes or whatnot to make sure that uh, if you don't like our sports banter, you can skip it. Uh, if you're a Rams fan, you can skip it. If you're a, a <laughs> Patriots fan, you could skip it. Uh, everyone else, make sure you always listen to our sports banter. Um, 
Well, cool, man. You want to give a shout out to our friends over at DAT, and then we'll get into our awesome topic for today. Yeah, taking the guesswork out of freight with DAT. The DAT Load Board Network is the largest on-demand freight marketplace in North America, connecting freight brokers with available capacity on any lane. Grow your business with tools that allow you to find new business partners, plus you can quickly qualify and onboard new carriers. With the industry's leading freight rate data, you can make clear and confident pricing decisions. Check out the show notes for a free month of Power, Express, or Trucker's Edge. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, I'm also in, I'm in the new studio this week. It's actually not a studio. It's just my basement. But uh, you have a laid out basement last week. Your basement's enormous. It's like the entire footprint of your house. You could literally have a family of three live in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pretty sweet, man. I, I mean, I, I would show what I'm looking at, but I've got the little man cave area with all my bill stuff. Sorry, guy that fast forwarded through the sports banter, but uh, I've got my signed Josh Allen picture. I've got a signed Coach McDermott jersey. I've got a uh, signed Jim Kelly helmet. I've got a Jordan Poyer signed hat. I've got a LaShawn McCoy signed cleat. Some other stuff. Nice TV on the wall. Sectional, t- uh, sectional couch. The only thing that's weird about this basement is when we bought this house, the wall, you, I don't know if you can see, the walls are like purple down here. It's like a purple. Uh, it's kind of gray. gray from my point of view, but that could yeah, be the light. It's like I a can't purplish see the, gray. Yeah. Um, but Also, you forgot about the huge bar that is directly in front of you. Yeah, <laughs> the there's a bar, bar that I'm staring at. And behind the bar is a fitness room. And um, then I got this. So this area that I'm in right now, like my desk will go up and down and it's on wheels. So I like can shove it in the corner. I only use this desk when we're doing the podcast and stuff, but um can roll it in the corner. And then we just put together a uh, ping pong table the other day that it can also roll in here and fold out. We got it as a, my wife and I got it as a gift for basically from uh, my brother-in-law. It was a, uh, he basically said, you're not getting anything else the rest of the year. So it's both of our birthdays and both of our Christmas gifts, so, uh, <laughs> but it's good stuff. So, all right, let's get into our actual content. Sorry to keep the banter going, but we want to talk about what makes a good prospect and essentially a good customer. Um, you know, because a lot of folks out there when they're prospecting for new business, they don't really know where to start or, you know, what kinds of companies they should be targeting. And we thought it was important to have a conversation about it and kind of give some success stories that we've had uh, within our brokerages. And I can speak on behalf of a bunch of the the agents that I've worked with. Um, So I want to, I want to kind of start off with, what is important to a customer and how they operate and where a broker can come into play. So you've, you've tossed out a stat like, you know, Hey, if they're not doing, you know, 20 full truckloads a week, it's probably not enough business for them to really need a freight broker. Right. Um, So why is that? Talk, talk us through why, why you should look at that. That one of the things like that was the qualifier question that I was taught when I first started. Right. And they had said, And the way it was taught to me, and it makes a lot of sense, at least still to me, is that like one person as a freight broker has a very similar job to one person as a load planner, right? And let's say you're a freight broker and you're moving about 20 loads a week, right about 20, between 20 and 30, depending on your experience, your skill level and your speed, right? You need, you're going to need your first assistant somewhere around there. Like I, and then still to this day, like right around 27 loads over the road, I will start to lose where my trucks are. So like, and I can, I I mean, it's always been that number. Like I really have to start relying on my TMS more for details. I can't remember as much, but also here's the other thing, like depending on which market you're in, you're going to start having a few fallouts if you've got 20 to 25 loads per week, meaning you are going to need last minute, just in time help to get more trucks, right? That's where the need for a broker comes in, right? So if you as a broker really running into issues, meaning you're probably going to be running out of time, not going to be able to prospect too much. If you're running 25 loads a week, meaning you've got to cover them, check call them, deal with your customers, deal with issues over the road. You will need a full assistant very shortly, either now or right around the corner. Right. And it's very much similar from the shipper's point of view. Like if you are booking five loads a day, one load at least every other day is probably falling out because they're late at their last receiver. They got held up. There's some traffic issue, like normal things that just happen getting a truck from one place, a receiver to the next shipper. Yeah. There are all these things that happen, right? And that's where like a shipper really does need the flexibility of a brokerage. They're ve- it's very unlikely that if they've got five trucks they need to pick up today, they can call an asset company and an asset 
can reposition a truck and a driver to make that pickup unless they just happen to have an extra truck that just happens to be empty that day. So, so that's ask, really where the value comes in. Let's say, let me ask you this though. Let's say <clears throat> a, a shipper only has, you know, eight or 10 loads a week to go out. I mean, they're, they're not always going to be able to cover all of that freight with asset based carriers. Correct. And here's the other question I try to ask, because this is a gray area. There's not really a, a way to draw that line. But the question I ask to get insight into the urgency, exactly what you're saying, right? Just because I'm moving eight loads a week as a shipper doesn't mean I'm going to be able to only use assets. The thing that determines whether or not they will be more brokerage or asset is how long they know about the loads before it's got to pick up. So for instance, if you've got a shipper that's running eight loads a week, but they know three weeks in advance how many loads are gonna be shipping, or they know a month in advance, because for whatever reason, their customer's buying pattern is pretty stable throughout that month or that year. So like with a very high degree of you know certainty, those eight loads are gonna be available in three weeks. Well, that's a great fit for an asset company because they can plan for it, position their trucks around and match that up with other loads. Now, if they find out about their eight loads per week, three hours or 24 hours before they've got to pick up. Now, an asset company is not a fit for almost any of those eight loads because unless they've got a local asset company that has idle trucks that can just, they can send on a day's notice, which is pretty unlikely, they need a broker. And again, it's always on the amount of time a shipper has to work on a load that determines whether or not yeah. that load is going to be a fit for a broker or an asset company. So, so I was going to say, I've got, um, I've got a, a, a few agents that some of their customers are small, maybe two to three loads a week. And they, they usually get first dibs at all their freight. Um, and the reason is that it's, you know, the, the shipper doesn't have any tools to source carriers directly. Yes. So they're and not that's using a huge, And I would say like, that's this other, like I call it like a honey hole, right? You can't find these until you're talking to them. But, and, and I use this like with, I don't know. It's, it's positive what I'm saying, but like they're less sophisticated as it relates to shipping some of the smaller shippers. Yeah. So to your point, maybe they're only shipping six to 10 loads a week, maybe even two or three. I have a client that picked one of those up last week and the guy just wanted somebody he can trust. They make all their money doing their normal day-to-day -day business. Like this is right. a construction company. They're not trying to make money on their shipping margins. Do you know why? Because they're rolling that right into their bill anyway. Whatever's going to pay for that piece of equipment to arrive Shipments included in the bill. So they're just passing that cost off and yep. they're not really trying to make money on the shipping. So again, they want someone they know that they can send the truck, that it's at least a fair rate and that's someone they like to work with. And again, the example from like the past two weeks, a client of ours that you've worked with too, like you got four loads. They only ship between three and five every week. But again, they they didn't really like who they were using. They wanted somebody that they knew that was local. They were local to where our cut, you know, our broker that we coach is. And they're like, look, we like working with you. This rate seems fair. They send them the load. Is what it is. Tell me if there's an issue picking yeah. up. And those are the customers, honestly, that are the best. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about if you have like a local machine shop or some some, you know, some some kind of local company that they make something and it gets shipped out on a flatbed or, you know, whatever the case might be, but they're a small enough operation that they've got one dock door, right? That's it. Or maybe they have two in case they get deliveries inbound and they load out at the same time. Um, and the person that's ensuring that the freight gets picked up, it's not their full-time job as a traffic manager. Right. They might be like an operations manager that also has to wear the hat of, Hey, make sure that we can get a truck in here. And then they'll, you know, they'll use a broker for those little, it might be one a week, right? It might mm -hmm. be like three a month or something like that. And on a lot like, so examples of companies like that are like, um, like ref like I want to say like refurbishment type of companies like a uh, I know like of some that mm -hmm. um, we work with that were they would refurbish like big diesel engines yeah. right I've so, seen that with like printing presses things like that yeah. larger pieces of equipment that get refurbished or um, I've had customers that ship those yeah. right they're like twenty thousand pound one piece of machine right or so, fifteen thousand pound one machine. Exactly. But the thing to remember here is you're not going to make your book of business off of these customers. These Correct. are kind of the exception to the rule, but they are good fits if you can build that relationship. Now, and that's, go ahead. Cause I, and I'd say the one part that I wanted to clarify, right? Cause when we said the qualifying, right? What I'm talking about is that's the number you want for your customers to build a book on. These are the yes. ones that if you get them, you sprinkle keep, them in, but you don't look for them. Like you're not, 
spending dozens of hours trying to get a load from somebody that's shipping a handful a week. Like if you get them, great, it's gravy. But again, because here's what normally happens. A lot of times they have another broker. Yes. Right. Because you have the trust. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but go where you were going down on that thought. So so I want to say, you know, going back to the 20 a week, right? And you explained it perfectly with thinking about when you, you know, you're not going to hire an assistant to help you run your book until you are kind of busting at the seams, right? And the same thing goes with shippers. So if they've got one person running their traffic department and they're doing, you know, 30, 40 loads a week, they can't handle it all on their own. They're going to need to rely on a broker for like, like steady amount of business to push through that brokerage. Um, And when you have that amount of volume to work with as a broker from your customer, that is a good customer that you can build your book of business off of. So you get, you get like two or three of those, that's how you can build your book. And you can sprinkle in some little ones in addition. And you can manage all that on your own. Um, I think once you get beyond that, then you're looking at building a team around you. But I would say the majority of of folks that I work with or inside of our company that they're just a one person show, they, I mean, they really usually have like one or two big customers, maybe three. And then a couple of little ones here and there that might do a load or two a month, exactly like we just prescribed there for you over the last couple of minutes. So um, I think when you look at, the sup, you know, somebody asked us yesterday, like, is there a certain revenue I should be looking at? And it's like, no, it's because it has nothing to do with revenue. You should be looking at volume of shipments. Okay. Now, the next part I want to talk about, and you you actually brought this up off air before, is the urgency of the load. And I like to also say, what is the consequence if that load is not delivered or picked up and delivered on time? And that's where we can come into play big. So let's 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 talk through that. I'm um uh, talk through like, you know, so you got your, your normal spot market where stuff can fall off last minute and all that. But in addition to that, you might have a load that just randomly pops up, um, on a Friday afternoon or something like that. And you can't necessarily get a carrier in there right away. A carrier, might, an asset based company might be able to say, yeah, you know, I can get someone in there Monday or Tuesday. And it's like, well, no, what we ship our customers need, otherwise production shuts down yep. or, what we're shipping, our customer needs, because if it's if it's late, it's going to miss the event. Like stuff like that. That is where we can tap into the entire open market as a broker and really be able to plug and play and present options to that customer. So I'm going to give you a few examples, right, and why that's the case, right? So why do you see this with food? And I'm not talking about just the spoiling part of the food, but the need to get product when you need it, right? Yes. And you see this, it's very common with grocery stores and retailers. I'm not saying you go that direction because they're also sometimes harder to get into and they're bigger companies. But to to prove this point, right, there is a very high cost to a grocery store having an empty shelf because that reflects poorly on them. And when the way we buy things in grocery stores is you're literally looking at what's on the shelf to determine what you buy. You're not like looking through a catalog and then going to buy the thing. The shelves are the catalog, right? So if there's an empty shelf, it reflects very poorly on that company. So when yeah. there are things selling at a very high rate, you will see high margins on those things. So the pandemic was a great example. Toilet paper, hand sanitizer, all of those things that needed to be stocked, companies were paying huge margins because, again, they couldn't have their sh- their shelves be empty because it reflected poorly on them. Like they need that now. Yeah, I'll give you um, two other examples. Number one, uh, we had a customer mushroom farm that they grew mushrooms in Pennsylvania, and they had a it was a single pick from the mushroom facility, and they would have multiple drops. Um, before it got to its found destination. So basically it went from Pennsylvania and delivered throughout um, New England and into the Midwest. But they, these deliveries were like extremely time sensitive because they had to be able to drop X amount of pallets in, um, you know, Ohio and then X amount in Michigan and then X amount and, you know, wherever, right? And they were like, overnight, you need team drivers. Imagine if you didn't get that mushroom, the mushrooms delivered to these, locations and time, they would not be able to have them for sale to their customers, right? And yep. another example, same um, same customer would ship to Hunts Point in the Bronx, right? Mm-hmm. Big, um, basically like a farmer's market. If that stuff is not delivered by the time the farmer's market opens, they can't sell any of it, right? And can't then, so like some, you, you, if it gets there too late and the market's not open, what are you going to do then? You're not going to like send it back. There's a shelf life on that to your, you know, I know we're, we're not talking about spoilage, but that is a big part of it. 
because mm-hmm. there's been situations where a, a carrier was late and they're like, go drop it off at a food bank because we, you know, we can't take it now. And it's not going to be good for next week. Yep. So, so, and here's what I wanted to cover a little bit. I want to squeeze some of these in there. So we go through these in coaching, but we have all of the different categories of questions that you ask, right? So I pulled up our list of consequence questions, right? And I'm just going to go through a few. And these are the questions that you ask to determine whether or not the shipper that you're talking to has a consequence if something doesn't get shipped when it's supposed to, right? Hey, if you let if you let the price be the only factor you use, how might that affect your business in the long run? What would happen if a carrier picked up without the proper insurance and got into an accident, right? The consequences, right? You're trying to determine what those are. Um, what does it do to your customer schedule when you push delivery times back? Like what is the consequence to your business and your business's customer's relationship if things aren't there when they're supposed to be there, right? What happens when carriers don't let you know that they're going to be late or have issues, right? Meaning you've got a fallout coming and the carrier didn't tell you, right? There's going to be likely a consequence. Are you personally held responsible for the trucks that you book on these loads? That's a really good one, right? Hey, yeah, is the person that's you're job speaking- security right there. Right. Hey, because in larger companies, that might not be as visible. In smaller companies, it's very obvious when loads aren't getting there. And when the customer's calling the sales rep or the company going, my product was supposed to be here yesterday, that reflects poorly on the entire business, right? And these are the things you're trying to ask to determine like how much tension is in the supply chain, right? If it's super loose and has a bunch of slack, it gets there when it gets there and there's no issue. If there's a lot of tension, meaning it's got to get there, there's going to be a big consequence if it doesn't get there when it's supposed to get there. Yeah, we had, um, I'm trying to think the, I, th- I probably told this story before. We had a customer, I want to say it was like last year and they were shipping these like really um, high quality like recliner chairs that were being used in some suite at like the national football championship game. And like, if it doesn't get there, that's a three hour event. Like Wait you second. can't be, you, if it's not there that morning, that's terrible. Um, trade shows are a great example of that. Concerts, say, trade, trade shows, shows are the next yeah. one too. Yeah. Um, I mean, trade shows literally, imagine if someone doesn't have their booth set up and they miss an entire day. The trade show might go for two or three days, but if they, you miss a single day, you're missing potential clients and vendors to, to network with and all that stuff. So trade shows are huge. Um, yeah. Um, and, and I want to point this out too. Like we're giving examples, but the reality is, is whoever you're talking to could be in this situation for a period of time within a year and not the whole year. And I want to point that out, right? Almost all shipping is seasonal to some degree where there is a peak they're shipping the most at some point of the year. And there's a low point where they ship the least amount because we don't buy most products at the same rate every single day, every week, right? Like there are different seasons to everything, right? Housing, all of it. But the one thing I want to point out is you got to ask questions. And this is why you can't find a good prospect by researching too much, right? You ever hear people say, oh, well, I'm going to move away from making a volume of calls and I'm just going to make better calls. It's bullshit and it's a cop out. Because I've never met anybody. And if they are, please reach out to us. They can find and determine who's a good customer before you've actually spoken to them, right? Because the reality is, is even when you're talking to them, like, hey, they might be shipping two or three loads a week, right? But in six weeks, it might be ramping up to peak where they're shipping 60 or 70 loads a week for the next three months. And then it falls back off, right? So again, you don't care just about what they're doing right now. You also care about where they are in that year. So asking them, hey, is this your peak season? How is this in relation to your peak season? Where are we at in the year? Are you expecting things over the next 60 days to change very much, right? You don't want to just know what's going on right now. You want to ask questions to know what's coming down the pipe in the next two, three months and if you're positioned correctly as well. Yeah, so um, two things. First, I want to give an example. Think about flowers in like before Valentine's Day and then before like Mother's Day, right? Mm-hmm. Huge, and there's a lot of peak customers that um, that operate like that. So there's a huge consequence if stuff's not delivered. Um, but those are like a flower, a florist or a flower shipper is it's a little bit more obvious to you as a consumer of when their peak season is because you probably have bought them flowers before. But other customers, you may not know, and it's good to ask those questions. So you might get an objection from a shipper and they say, "Ah, oh, no, you know, we're good. We don't have, we're not having any issues right now. Well, boom, right away. Well, hey, is this, uh, are you guys in your peak season right now? Or is that something that comes later in the year that you may need additional assistance with? So you've immediately deflected from that objection and put yourself in position for an opportunity down the road. And they can, it keeps that conversation going and it gets more information out of the shipper for you to understand how their business operates. So um, I like, I absolutely love the the concept of trying to understand 
put yourself in the shipper's shoes and understand what goes on behind the scenes there that you don't necessarily see. Because it could be a product that, like, it could be, um, I don't know, like a car parts. And you, how do you know when their manufacturing is at peak season? You yep. probably don't know. Do you know what the lead time is to get a muffler made and delivered to a store? You probably, you probably have no idea. Nope. And how do you, do you know when those are most needed throughout the year? I don't. Um, nope. So that's something you probably want to ask. So. And that's the whole thing, right? And I know we talk about this a lot, but go back and look at our previous episode on prospecting with a purpose. This is what this is based on, right? Everybody we've ever met that understands and knows somebody's supply chain, guess how they learned that? They didn't learn it by researching and going through like Quora articles. They learned it by asking questions and actively listening to what the person is saying, right? Not just waiting for the person to stop talking so you can say what's important to you, right? Asking questions because you're genuinely curious and you want to understand what's going on in their business. That's where you're going to get this insight. Absolutely. You got any other uh, cool questions in there that you want to you want to go through? Um, I don't. Let me see. This is a good one. Yeah. Have you ever had issues or rejections from your customers because you had late or damaged loads? And then the follow up question is, if they say yes, well, what happens if this continues, right? And you almost say it in that tone of voice, right? Like, yeah. hey. So that is something that, uh, again, what makes a good customer or a good prospect is when they, someone that needs reliability, because it's not just, oh, well, the product got there late. Well, they could lose their, your customer could lose their customer over someone dropping the ball when it comes down to transportation. Mm -hmm. and, and think about it. Freight spend is like the little, you're the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to the, you know, the spend for a, a shipper typically. So Imagine how much revenue they're going to lose if they lose a big customer. We were talking like millions and millions of dollars of revenue per year. They, they no longer have now and they have a staff and employees to pay. And now they lost that business because potentially an asset based carrier just fell off or no showed and took a, a higher paying load or a bad broker dropped the ball and, you know, thought they booked the truck, but actually didn't have a truck or hired, a, you know, not a good truck because they didn't vet them properly. That's where you as a, a good value add broker can truly service your customers by having that kind of service. And I think that's why it's important too, when you present options, right? Talk about the, uh, you know, the, the stuff that they, they might not think about. Like, hey, I can tell you, you know, I can tell you exactly what model year that the, tra the truck is that I'm going to be sending into you. And I'm going to try to get you one that's within the last five years instead of one that's like 15 years old. Um, that's the kind of stuff you could do. And they're, they're not going to know that with an asset based company unless, you know, they tell them and who knows. So Here, here's some of the other things to think about too, right? Especially when you're talking about the quality of the shipper, right? And here's why you need to ask a lot of questions and really get to know them to understand what's going on, on their side of the fence. And I'll give you another example, right? If pretty much every brokerage or every broker that listens to our show, looked at their book of business, the 80, 20 rule will come into effect. I think they call it the Pareto's rule, the law, yeah. Pareto's law, which is basically 80% of your business will come from 20% of your customers. And our business, I think it's closer to like 90, 10, like you will see a massive amount of your revenue coming from one or two of your customers. And, you know, in the next eight to nine of them, we'll probably do a little bit throughout the year, but they're not even close. Right. That also holds true for a shipper, right? So from the shipper's point of view, your example, and talking about their customers, let's say a shipper has 10 customers. One or two of them are going to be usually more of their most profitable and highest risk customers where they make most of their money from one or two or the other seven or eight by a little bit throughout the year. So guess what? When you're talking to them about their loads, if you just started talking to them, they aren't talking to you about those loads. They're talking to you about the loads going to the customers that are lower risk that they don't, they don't want to say they don't care if they lose, but there's not going to be as large of an impact if the load right. doesn't get delivered to somebody that buys occasionally from them. So or think things like lumber yards, right? A lot mm -hmm. of industrial building material where they've always got plenty of stock of it. And it's okay. If, hey, if it delivers two days or three days later, not a big right. deal. And that's why I'm, I wanted to get to is like when we're talking about the quality of a shipper, there's also another level of the quality of loads within a shipper that you need to ask questions about, right? So if they've got, we'll just say 100 loads a week for a round number like probably 50 or 60 of those are really important that are going to really important customers, 20 or 30 are probably in the middle. And they probably got 10% that are going to customers that rarely buy from them. So when you just start working with them, they are having you quote the least risky freight from their point of view. And the least riskiest freight from their point of view is also the one they're going to pay the least for. 
because they don't have any reason to pay any more than the lowest margin because they're not worried about that customer. You won't see their higher margin freight until you've worked with them long enough that you have gotten into this small circle of trusted brokers. That's when you start to see the other freight. I can't tell you how many brokers I know that have been in this industry for over three years that just this year found out dozens or hundreds of lanes their customers run they didn't even know about. Yep. They didn't ask, right? They get used to running whatever lanes they are, they're doing, and they never ask like, hey, what else are you working on? What other lanes do you guys run that we haven't talked about? You would be astounded at how much freight is behind what you've actually even seen. And you don't know until you <clears throat> ask. I had that, I had that happen with um, one of our folks earlier this year. Um, she had like, I want to say like three, there's probably like three lanes that she would always run and then had no idea they're running all these other lanes. And mm -hmm. I think, I think didn't even ask, but I think she got like, she said she got like an email that was not supposed to go to her, but she ended up on and she's like, wait a second, there's all this other freight here, but that's it. You know, that's a point in your career where you, you learn and you're like, okay, yep. now, now I know that. And have, if, if you don't listen to us and learn some of this stuff, or if you're someone you work with doesn't explain it or teach you, how would you ever know? How would you ever think, um, you know, to ask that kind of question? So, yeah. Here's two other questions before we move on from that one. How do rates affect the quality of the carriers you've been using, right? Getting the shipper to say out loud that the less they spend, the less on time their carriers are, right? It's like anything else. You get what you pay for. If you are paying on the bottom end of the market and you're shipping commodities like gravel and stone, right? They're going to have a lot of late pickups and a lot of late deliveries and they're okay with that, right? But if you've got somebody telling you that it's an urgent shipment, but yet they still don't want to pay you above the bottom of the market, right? These are the questions you want to ask to get them to, to get closer to the truth, right? Hey, I mean, are you guys see I mean, you're telling me you need this to pick up in the next three hours, but if I've only got this amount to work on it, I can see that it's pretty unlikely I'm even going to get a truck. And if I get a truck, they're probably going to fall out as soon as a better paying load comes anyway. So like, if they're not going to put their money where their mouth is, at least you can get them to admit that this is the type of freight you're working on. Um, yeah. And again, the, these these discussions and conversations happen over a series of phone calls. Yes. This doesn't all happen in, you know, one it's not like an time. interrogation. You're going to shine the light on them and pull them into the room, <laughs> slide up a chair. Like you see in like, How many you know, a week are you guys shipping? <laughs> when is your peak season? What happens if a shipment gets delivered late? Answers. I need answers right now. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> but this is true, right? This is where you you're able to determine the quality of the shipper through questions, right? Like I was using the analogy of like, We've talked about this before, like prospecting. Like I always picture the guy, like the old 49er in the 1800s with a pickaxe, you know, and a shovel and a donkey going up into the Black Hills in California or whatever to go find gold. Like your pickaxe and your shovel are your questions. You think there's gold there, but you don't know until you dig far enough to see what's under the ground. Your questions are your pickaxe and your shovel. That's what's going to determine whether or not it's worth digging further yep. or Pulling, getting out of the hole and going to dig somewhere else, i.e. finding yep. another prospect or getting into the next lead. Absolutely. You got any other uh, thoughts on what makes a good prospect or a good customer? Oh, I've got one more I want to add in. Um, if you are a full truckload brokerage that does not service LTL, uh, don't go after LTL customers. That might sound super obvious and super basic, but I've had people that are like, you know, hey, I got this, uh, you know, you know not not at uh, Pierce, but at other companies that we've talked with and coach that they're like, you know, I've got this customer that um, they're doing like, you know, 20 LTL shipments a week. And it's like, well, well, great. That's awesome. But do you have competitive LTL rates? Well, no, we don't do LTL. Well, you're not going to be able to do anything. And if you try to set up an LTL carrier yourself directly, you're not going to even be close when it comes to competitive rates. I mean, there's, there's other ways to go about servicing LTL and being competitive, but well, don't go after business that you you really won't be competitive in or won't be a good fit for. And I think that's worth pointing out because I think the cause of that is there's a common blow off when you call and ask about full truckload and shippers will say, oh, we only ship LTL because they think that will get you off the phone. What then happens is, is a person new hears that enough that they're like, well, clearly there's a lot of money to be made over here. Everyone's telling me they do this. Let's do this. But you've got to ask again, more questions to determine, like Nate said, is there a need for you to provide LTL or are they just saying this to you? And second of all, 
can you provide the service at a competitive rate? Because guess what? If they're shipping 20 LTO, they didn't just start shipping this week. It means they have relationships and they have worked rates down to some reasonable rate that they're comfortable with. So yeah. to compete, you're literally going to need to be able to compete at least to some degree on rate as well. Because you also yeah. don't have much control or any control over service either with LTO. So another thing too is like, um, like the... If you get out of LTL and full truck load and you get into your, some of your smaller equipment, like your hot shots and straight trucks and box trucks, sprinter vans, um, if you don't have a network of carriers that operate in that realm, it's, you know, you're not going to be very competitive as a broker to try and secure trucks for a customer like that. So, you know, don't, don't try to be everything for every single customer because it's, it's going to be a waste of your time. Well, and I think that's the one thing I kind of want to end this on is that like the juice needs to be worth the squeeze. And what you see that is very common amongst, you know, like experienced freight brokers is they will spend way more time prospecting to find the right customer than trying to make a customer that isn't a fit work, right? That's the biggest thing I think changes between your first year and like your third year in this industry. In your first year, you're so excited to get opportunity that you're trying to make anything work. And you're really spending a lot of time covering loads at like lower market rates. As you get into your career a year or two, and you can see that there are customers like we were just talking about, the right customers that really need what you're providing. When you find those, the relationship just works. It's easier to cover loads. You're spending less time with fallouts because you're pairing a fair rate. Your customer really needs it. You're not trying to make a round peg fit in a square hole, right? Like it, I, I always feel like if you're going to err, err on the side of if it doesn't feel like it's going to work as a prospect, go and find the right prospect because the more effort you're spending on activity and trying to get in front of the right people, the better opportunities that are going to come your way. Yeah, I think of this analogy. Um, we've all had that friend that they're dating somebody that is just they're just a terrible just couple together and them. they're like they're like no i'm gonna make it work i, I can change them it's like for no. years yeah <laughs> right yeah. exactly um well good stuff i'm gonna give a shout out to our friends over at lean before we hop into our q a lean solutions group is the industry leader in near shore staffing solutions with offices in south america and now in the philippines including freight broker back office operations accounting tech development, business development, marketing, customer service, and many other positions. To learn more about the vast solutions that Lean has to offer your freight brokerage or agency, visit them online at www.leangroup.com. So we've got two questions. Well, actually, we had three. The first one was, can you guys add timestamps? Yes, we can. Uh, next question. If we don't have a truck, can we get an MC number? Do you remember this question coming through? Was it we didn't get a whole lot of context to it, but I think what she was trying to ask was, um, I don't have any assets, but I, I'm assuming she wanted to know if she can get an asset authority. Correct. Like, well, and, even if she wasn't, the answer is yes. If you were just yeah. curious about the gen just getting an MC, you do not need assets to have an MC. Motor yeah, that's number. Like, that's like saying, um, can I be a freight broker without customers? Yeah, you can get your MC. You're not gonna do it. You're not gonna make any money doing it. Um, but here's what I want to caution you because some people, they hear the objection. Oh, we only work with asset based companies. Well, don't, don't go and get an asset authority and then think you can still go and broker their freight. Like it's just not, you know, it's not the way that it works. Um, and the other thing here too, is it, it almost, it almost screams double broker scam to me. Like, what are you trying to do that to to take loads from a broker and then you're just going to broker them, double broker them out, which is why if you have zero assets and somebody looks you up on FMCSA or through whatever vetting site they're looking at, you're going to show zero for the number of power units you have registered. That's a huge red flag. Yes. So can you do it? Sure. <clears throat> is it beneficial? No. So, all right. Um, next question. What should I do if my customer loads more weight or pallets than the carrier originally thought? Um, That's a good question. This, this is a great question because it, it, it has happened. Often. You know, someone, so here's the issue is there's a couple issues. Number one, the carrier might not have the weight capacity to load more, right? So if they're being told it's a 20 foot shipment, it needs 20 feet of a flatbed and it weighs 10,000 pounds. All right, 
Well, they can partial up with something else or on account of Stoga, right? Where, where you can have multiple loads on there and they're easy, easy to unload without touching the other freight. Well, now you show up, that this carrier shows up and they've already, they're already loaded with 30,000 pounds. They've got your 20 foot of space, but next thing you know, it's a, you know, 20 or 25,000 pound shipment. Well, now that carrier, that truck's going to be overweight. They can't scale legally now. So that's the first issue that um, I see. But the other thing too is a lot of times there is some correlation between the weight of the shipment and a, an expected price. If you're loading a, a truck to its full capacity for weight versus you know something that's only 8,000 pounds, you're, you're literally using more fuel to haul that. And if it's going like 1,000 or 1,500 miles, that adds up. So it's money right there. Now, yeah, here's the other. Th- here's the. Go ahead. I was gonna say. I was just. You, you want to get ahead of this, and you know, bad news gets worse with time. I always say that. Um, you you should try to verify their customer of all the shipment details before a truck gets there. But as soon as you find out, you need to get on the horn with your customer and address it because that's. You might have to be. You might have to pay a tow new. You might have to pay more money to the truck. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that come into play here. Yeah, I have a client with a customer that does this and just the nature of their business, they they think they know what's going in the truck, but by the time the truck gets there, the number changes a bit often um, and it's lower weight stuff, but the piece count changes and why this normally causes an issue and they'll have trucks that literally just leave without, without they'll be like, hey, I got this signed and like literally leave. Then their customer will call and yell because they didn't pick up the extra one or two. But why that ends up being an issue is because mostly because the driver feels taken advantage of. They feel yeah. they were sold a bill of goods and they were they received something else. So yep. if you can confirm before the driver is actually loading, it eliminates these like nine out of 10 times, almost all the time. And again, like I know sometimes they happen. So if you can get back to your shipper and just say, look, I know things change, but even if you can get a guy in the dock and be like, hey, look, even if he shoots me a text message or an email, anything on just what he thinks in the next hour they're going to put on this truck, because even if it's five minutes before the guy checks in, you've got a better likelihood that the driver's not going to get pissed off and you're not going to have a problem as long as you know before. Yeah. the la- And the last thing I'll add to this is um, there are certain commodities that ship um, and they pay <clears throat> per like per bag or per hundred pounds. Potatoes. Per potatoes, right? Like that's big. So if you're Onions. getting paid because um, pr- potatoes are shipped in 50 pound bags. So if if they're, if they're saying, hey, we're going to pay you, I'm just going to make up this rate because I don't know what lane we're talking about, but we'll say, hey, we're going to pay you $5 per bag. That's that's a realistic price depending on whatever lane you're in. And then you say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to pay my uh, carrier, you know, four twenty five dollars a bag. And then you multiply it out by however many bags will fully scale it out at like 42,500 pounds or whatever. And the carrier thinks they're getting that, that rate. And then your customer only ends up loading you know, say 41,000. So now you got 1500 pounds worth of potatoes that you're not getting paid on. And your, your carrier is going to be like, well, I I'm supposed to get paid this amount. If you yeah. have, so first of all, uh, all in pricing is like the easiest way to go to, to eliminate yeah. this. But the other option is you got to have that stuff broken down on your rate confirmation with notes that say like, this is your rate. If you load to max, if it's loaded any less, it, your pay will be, you know, 425 times the number of p- bags of potatoes that are loaded. So, yep. yeah, well, good stuff, man. Um, we're getting, we're tight on time here. We're going to wrap it up. Um, you got any, any, uh, any other just things you want to yeah, go over? I was going through this. I put some notes on this too, because I've been thinking about this a lot, lot last couple of weeks. What is it like? Because we're just seeing this with the uh, number of spot loads hitting the spot market as opposed to what was hitting there last year. And the question I would leave everyone kind of with is if you lost your biggest customer, right? Would your book of business still be profitable? And ask yourself, what if you lost your two top customers? Would you still be profitable, right? Would you still be able to pay your bills if you're just an agent, right? Because the thing is, it's inevitable that at some point or another, you're going to lose customers. And it's sometimes, in fact, most often, no fault of your own. We were talking about this yesterday, right? Like company can get bought by another company. Company can be acquired by another company that has assets or a different relationship with other brokers, right? Your point of contact could get promoted and somebody else gets in there and their brother owns a brokerage, right? There's a thousand different things that could happen that could basically, if one or two of your customers is where you're making all your money from, that's a big risk, right? 
And yeah. it was making me think of this because I was watching that. Do you see the Hulu documentary on Mike Tyson that just came out this week? No. It came out last week. It's pretty good. But it was funny, like that famous quote, right? Like everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? And it just reminded me of this topic, right? And it's like, do you have a plan for when this is inevitably going to happen, right? Meaning, what does your prospecting funnel look like? How many hot prospects, how many medium you know, prospects do you have? How many are you actively trying to get to the finish line? Because if you're not pushing in that direction, it's inevitable your business is going to shrink. Yep. And it's much easier to do it from a place of abundance, meaning you're making enough money to pay your bills than it is to do when you've lost the customer. Because you're going to sound desperate. You're going to yep. be asking for things that aren't a good fit. And the, the shipper, the person you're prospecting is going to hear that loud and clear. Whether or not you say it or not, they're going to hear it in your tone of voice and they're going to hear it in your desperation. When you come from a place of abundance, you you got more pep in your step. You got more swag, man. I'm telling you, the, the people that are are already doing well in sales and have an abundance mindset are the ones that continue to just keep doing better and better and better because yep. they've planned properly from the beginning. It's the ones Momentum that get desperate. Morale. That yeah, the ones that get desperate make mistakes and usually end up. That's it. They end up. They 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 leave the and industry. It, so. It's funny, right? I, on a super side note, I was listening to this new podcast, How to Take Over the World, and they do biographies of like world conquerors, like Napoleon, Alexander the Great, and all these other leaders. And almost every single one had this in common. They said three quarters of every battle they've ever fought, whether it was political or literal fight, right? They said morale and energy was three fourths of it. In fact, there were instances where like they would literally pull out of a battle they were winning because they thought they were losing morale, right? It's the same thing in our world, right? It's tough to deal with rejection all day. It's tough to deal with these things. But again, if you can take that momentum and you got to win, the best thing you could do after a good call is pick up the phone and take that energy into the next one and to try to ride that momentum as long as you can. Love it. You got another quote here too. Yeah. Good. You can read it. Warren Buffett. I think I've, I've referenced this one before. You don't mm -hmm. find out who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. I love that. <laughs> It's true, man. And that's what you're seeing with a lot of brokerages, I think, this year was everybody thought that ride for the past two years was going to be indefinite and they could ride that for another decade. But the reality is, is our market, our market is going to constantly cycle, right? So you want to yep. be prepared for the next turn, not just the market you're in right now. You got it. Well, that is a wrap for episode 156. What do you got for us, Ben? Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. And if you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week.